And then Aaron, if you want to go ahead and start recording and I can edit this first little section out. Sweet dear one. Okay, we are live on we're on, we're live on um, YouTube. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute everything and okay, I'm gonna show through the live stream. Hi there, if you are looking for the critical uh, business updates for business owners every other Wednesday, you are in the right spot. Uh, this is the Eastern Colorado Call, and we are so happy to have you with us today. We've got a lot to go over, some really great resources. Let's go ahead and go to that next slide. So before we jump in, I want to recognize all the partners that we've had with these great calls that we've been hosting every other Wednesday. Uh, first and foremost, Startup Colorado. We have the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade, the Galala Commons, East Colorado SBDC, Grow Seco, the Telluride Foundation, Central Mountain SBDC, and the Northwest Colorado SBDC. Next slide. So to kick things off, um, you're getting a welcome from me, Lisa Hudson. Hi there, Director of the East Colorado Small Business Development Center. Um, next up, we have Nancy Murphy, the Director of the Small Business Development Center for Region 10, the West Central SBDC. And then we're going to um, follow it up with a Q&A and wrap up. So today we've got Beyond Social Media, which is all about marketing strategies for small businesses. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenter, Nancy Murphy, and you can take it away. Thanks, Lisa. <clears throat> it's great to be with be with you all today. Um, today we're going to cover beyond social media marketing strategies for small businesses, and we're going to um, basically we're going to start with looking at how most businesses go about marketing. Sort of feels like this to consumers; they feel like we're getting ye that we're yelling at them. And it sort of looks like this because we're trying to throw every gimmick into whatever we're trying to promote or what we're trying to communicate. So this guy's got discounts, 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 and he's got the dog in the, in the picture too to get you interested. But basically this is what's going on when we see that kind of stuff. So we're here to talk about how to have some framework around marketing and how to think about your marketing more strategically. I think of marketing a lot like an iceberg because most people think about marketing in terms of what they can see, which is this part here. But what's really going on is what's down below is the, is the part you can't see. And that's really where the rubber meets the road because it doesn't matter what you put at the top of the iceberg. If you haven't, if you haven't, um, created the foundation and a substantial base of um, strategy below it, it can wreck your ship. So, so in that way, it's a, it can be a big mess. So in the next 45 minutes, we're going to talk about what marketing is, why you need it, how it works, why yours may not be working, and how to plan, uh, how to plan for success. So here's our first poll. Taylor, um, will you put that up? So what are you marketing? This is trying to figure out um, who am I talking to today? So it helps a little bit if I know how to adjust the, how to adjust our conversation. So are you marketing a product? Are you marketing a service? Do you own a retail store? Are you a restaurant? Are you something else? I have a, uh, another poll following that as, and the question is, is, are you a business to consumer business or are you business to business? So that'll be helpful to know too. So if you'll fill that out. So while you all are doing that, I'll give you just a little bit of background from my world. And uh, basically I approach marketing from, uh, from a consumer packaged goods side. So I'm a classically trained marketer, which means that um, I have training in consumer products, and uh, as a result, I've worked internationally, nationally, and um, with global brands. And these are just a few of the, uh, the companies I've worked with, um, either as an employee, a consultant, or, um, or that. Yeah. Okay. 
So we have the first results in for our, what are you marketing? And the majority of people, 55% are marketing a service. Um, we have 27% who are marketing other. So I'm wondering what that is. So if you can put that in the q and I'd, I'd love to know what you're doing. Um, and we're, oops, I lost the last bit of that. Okay, now we're on to the second one. Are you business to consumer or business to business? So while you all do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about mar what marketing is. Um, marketing is the revenue function of your business. So uh, money only comes into your business through customers and, your, and marketing is the relationship with the customers. So marketing's goal is to connect your product or service with the right target and the customer. So it's the revenue function and uh, the goal is, is to create a win-win exchange by the business providing a product or service that's of value to a customer that a customer is willing to give us money for, so or give us cash that supports our business. Marketing is the function in your business that actually generates the revenue, so it's really important. Um, I've, I've taught business planning classes for a long time, and I, it's always funny to me when we get people who say, well, I'm not going to do any marketing. And I think, well, you know, that's really awesome. So if you don't need any customers and you don't need any money coming into your business, that's, that's a great place to be. So <laughs> otherwise, everybody needs to, needs to do marketing and they need to understand what marketing is. So the bottom line of marketing is it's really providing the right product or service to the right customer or client at the right price in the right place. And that means the distribution point with the right promotion. So that's a quick and easy way to think about what it is. So another poll up oh, here, business to business, we're 50-50 on business to business and business to consumer. So um, just so you business to business people know, this is basically based toward Business to consumer, I don't have a lot of experience with business to business, just so you know. And, and the reason I mention that is because the business to business process is a little bit different than business to consumer. Business to business, um, you have to really work with who are the key decision makers, which you also have to do with um, business to consumer, but the key decision makers can be several people within a business. So. Um, that's something to think about. So one question I have for you all, which is our next poll, is um, how many of you did research for, as to a product service market fit before opening your business? I find on the Western Slope, I, I live over here on the Western Slope, and I find that most people start a business because they're really good at doing something. And so uh, they don't really think about who's going to use it. They just know that they can do something and they're trying to monetize it. So sometimes that's kind of a sticky situation of where to be when you're trying to sell a product or a service. Um, one time, well, I'll get into that story next in a little bit, but um, we'll see what we get on that. Marketing is really all about the numbers. A lot of people talk about uh, about the creative side of it. And it is somewhat creative, um, but the majority is really about the numbers. Um, the creative side really comes in the messaging part. So I am happy to see that 75% of you all actually did research to figure out a product service market fit before opening your business. Yay, congratulations, <laughs> that's awesome. So back to the numbers. So marketing is really about the numbers and um, the numbers are really tied to what your business needs to operate. So your marketing numbers are closely tied to your cash flow. So if you know in your cash flow, you're looking at um, your revenue side and your expense side and your marketing should be your revenue side and it needs to cover all those expense sides. So you need to know how much you need to make. Um, the other thing is, is not only in the numbers of knowing how much money you need to make, is you need to be able to translate into how many sales that is or how many customers there are. So for example, over here, we work with a um, food distribution uh, 
business. And what they do is they know that the majority of their uh, consumer sales are $42 a bag. So how many bags do they need to sell to make their daily, their daily goals? So that's, that's how you equate the customer with the um, amount of money you need to make. So the reason we tie it all back to the cash flow is because those are clear, clean numbers in terms of dollars that we have to make and in terms of how many customers it'll take to make those dollars. So as Zig Ziegler says, is you can't hit a target you can't see and you can't see a target that you don't have. So it's really important to pay attention to your numbers and, and set your targets so that you know to, uh, so you know what you're trying to hit at. The other thing is it's really important to have a plan. Um, um, one of my favorite sayings is businesses don't plan to fail, they just fail to plan. And when we fail to plan, we look like that, um, that loop-de-loop -loop up at the top of, you know, we're going all different directions because this sounds good and then that sounds good. And then of course, as, on, as entrepreneurs, most of us have shiny dime syndrome. So we might take off to whatever shiny versus paying attention to what our goals are and what our focus are. So that's why it's important to have the plan. So a marketer has a toolbox that is a really awesome thing to know about. Um, most people don't think about this. It's called the four P's. You may have heard that term or the marketing mix. And it refers to products and services, price, place, which is the distribution point and uh, promotions. It couldn't be the four P's if place was distribution. So that's why it's the four P's. And then uh, there's also the customer target that you're going to be able to manipulate. So I like this little graphic because it shows somebody being able to manipulate these dials. So that's what we're able to do as marketers is we can tweak the product or service line a little bit. We can tweak the price. We can tweak our distribution point. We can change up our promotions all based on what we're trying to do. So this is really your toolkit and you're going to want to be uh, playing with this on a regular basis. You may also want to play in your um, in your customer or segment base because you may want to you may want to expand and try a new segment and see if you get traction on that. So these are sort of things we play with. So the first thing is honing our product or service. And a lot of people think that the product or the service is just this big this big immovable thing that it has to be this certain thing all the time. And the product can really morph and change or, or a service can too. So we'll talk just a little bit about that. But the first issue with a product is really understanding what problem your product or service solves for the customer. Because the reality is, is that customers aren't just sort of like out there scouring the horizon looking for something to buy. They're really looking to solve a problem. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about what those problems look like. But it's just so key to make sure that you are providing a solution for someone. Um, I was at, a, at um, let's see, last summer when Startup Week was in Grand Junction, I heard these two awesome guys do a presentation about product feasibility and, and market um, acceptability. And they went around the room and they talked about, they asked all the participants what their business idea was. And they came across this one woman and these two guys looked at each other and they're like, you sound like you're a solution in search of a problem. So there's kind of a problem if we don't have, if we're a solution to no problem, because if nobody identifies that as a problem, chances are we're not gonna sell very much and we're not gonna um, make any money. So this is just a list of questions of um, things you want to consider in your product. One of the things about the product is um, just in terms of what that what you're trying to get that customer journey to look like through your product. So, for example, um, what do you want your customers to do? So in a perfect world, we want customers to keep coming back 
and buying, buying whatever it is we sell. But sometimes we have to have a line of products or services that we move them into the first one and then they buy the second one and then they buy the third one. And what that looks like is uh, General Motors did a great job of that with how they uh, initially figured out their product line. So what they did is they had Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac. And what the goal was is the Chevrolet was the entry point. It's the lowest price product. And it's the entry point into the GM product line. And so what the goal was is to get people to buy in at the at the Chevrolet level, and as they progressed in their careers and made more money, they would buy the Pontiac and then move up to the Oldsmobile and then to the Buick and then eventually to the Cadillac. That's a little bit different now because they own so many other product lines, but that was their initial customer journey. So if you can think about your own product or service, in terms of what are you trying to get customers to do? Because it's really important to remember that it is easier to keep a customer than get a customer because the cost of customer acquisition is way more expensive than the cost of keeping a customer. The other part is, is it's so important to be able to differentiate your product or your service. And um, in those business planning classes I told you about is uh, I get a lot of people who say, well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the point of differentiation. Nobody does it like me. And I'm here to tell you that that is probably not a good enough point of differentiation. So you really need to be able to differentiate yourself in terms of you know, your product, your distribution, your promotion, your customer service. Um, generally speaking, most products and services are pretty indistinguishable. Um, generally speaking, it's the customer service that sets it apart. And a really great example of that is thinking about all the retail outlets in the world. And then there's Nordstrom. And Nordstrom is really awesome with their customer service or just the difference between Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, Lowe's tends to focus more on customer service than Home Depot does. So those are just a couple of examples of that. We'll move on to price and price I think is one of the biggest issues for businesses. Um, most people don't know how to price and pricing is a little bit tricky. It's all based on costing and it's costing, it's, it's being able to cost out everything it takes to deliver your product. So um, I gave you a list up at the top under um, set your prices. It, it talks about the things that are required in, in pricing or costing. So um, there are three terms that are really important to understand, and that's cost, price, and value. Cost is what it costs you to make it. Price is what you um, sell it for. And value is the perceived value in the customer's mind. So um, value doesn't necessarily mean cheap. It just means um, for what I'm getting, is that a good value? And earlier I gave an example of some people may think a Honda is an awesome value of a car because they're great cars, they, um, they, they're very reliable, they don't take a lot of maintenance, they get good gas mileage, and that's an awesome value. To some people, they may think, well, a BMW is an awesome value, even though it's so much more expensive. But the point of value in that consumer's head is that it's really fun to drive. It's not as expensive as a Porsche. It's really fun to take corners. I prefer to do road trips in that, you know, all sorts of things like that. So all sorts of things go into perceived value. Um, one thing I want to remind you is that um, price often signals quality. So if you're trying to be the low cost provider, that's a really scary thing. Uh, Walmart pretty much owns that and they do that intentionally because nobody can compete on price. If you try to compete on price, you'll probably go out of business. So it's important to have the right costing so that you have the right price and that you're able to add value so that you're so that you deliver something people want. Um, one thing that I also put in this list of questions is how price sensitive are your customers? So for example, if you raise the price a lot, will they, will, how many will fall off? Or um, what you can do is if you have sort of, you know, right now we're sitting in the middle of COVID, 
and um, our distribution and supply chains are a little bit um, kinked and we can't get product as quickly. So there's an opportunity to raise your prices so that you decrease the demand. So um, you still make your money, but you can't sell as many because you don't have as many to sell. So that's sort of something to think about. The other thing is people often ask me about discounts. And um, as I said, it's really hard to compete on price. And so discounts really are a slippery slope. What happens is if you try to lead with discounts to get new people in the door, you're always gonna get what we call bottom feeders. So for example, you may give me a really good discount to get me in the door. And just so you know, um, pretty much nobody gets off the couch for less than 20% discount. So be aware of that. Um, so all of a sudden the discounts have to be pretty high to even motivate anybody. But people who seek out discounts, and you and I may be part of those people on occasion, but we don't do it all the time. But people who do it all the time are going to end up costing you more in the long run because they're higher maintenance, they complain all the time, they, they're just not the people you want. So I'm going to look up here because we have a question and I'm going to see what that is. Oh, I've cut out twice. Okay, not sure what to do about that, but thanks for letting me know. It's your, it, it sounds like it's uh, audio is much better. So I continue to keep on going. Great presentation. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, so I would really caution you to look at discounts. Um, the only time I recommend doing discounts is when you have aging uh, inventory. So for example, if you sell skis, and it's um, paddleboard season. You need to you need to clear those you need to clear those skis out of your inventory and um, put them on sale and get them out of there uh, because it's paddleboard season. So if you ha have aging inventory or if you have inventory that's going to spoil. So for example, if you're a restaurant or a grocery store, just so you know, most restaurants have specials of the day because that fish is about to go bad. So not always the best thing to order the special of the day. So that's how they get rid of them. Uh, so just pay attention to those things. Um, be very careful about discounts. Uh, in this case, a lot of people ask me about volume pricing. And I think volume pricing is good. But remember, volume is 10, 20, 50, 100. It's not onesie, twosie. So you want to pay attention to that. Uh, I think that's all I want to cover on that. So we'll go to the customer. You've got to know your customer. And I don't mean think you know who they are. You need to know who they are. And that, that brings up our next, our, next, um, our next poll. So how many of you know who your customer is? Is it everybody? You know it exactly. Have no doubt. Have a pretty good idea think you know, what is it? I'm going to, um, while y'all are answering that, I'm going to go to the next one. As I mentioned before, people are looking for products um, and, and services for solutions. They are not looking for um, just for fun. And interestingly enough, as marketing is sort of this crazy cross between psychology and, and economics, and it's a lot of science and a little bit of art and a whole bunch of stuff rolled together. So when we look at what the motivation is behind purchases is it's usually related to Maslow's hierarchy of, of need, starting with the physiological, the safety, the love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization. Generally speaking, the products and services that we'll be dealing with have to do with safety. And those are things like insurance and you know, water filters and clean, you know, clean, clean things, and then love and belonging in terms of sometimes how we give gifts. So we, we might shop at a, a retail store for the perfect gift, and that's around love and belonging. And then sometimes we buy luxury products because we think it's really cool to have, um, you know, a logo on our shirt or whatever, and that's more related to esteem. In the world of um, luxury products, which is where I've mostly lived, is it's pretty much all about esteem. And um, that's a really interesting thing to deal with. 
Most of you are probably dealing with one or two of these things on the hierarchy and needs. Um, physiological is really basic, like water, shelter. Um, Self-actualization has to do more with uh, power and enlightenment. So it's kind of out. If you're Deepak Chopra, you might be doing self-actualization. So that's a little bit of those. Okay, so we're back to do we know who the customer is? And I will say that 45% uh, of you have a really good idea, 27% Absolutely, without a doubt, that is awesome. Congratulations. And 18% um, say that everyone is their customer. And I'm going to pick on you all just so you know, those of you who think everyone is your customer. So it's really important to think about, it, it's important to create a singularity of target. And the reason we do this is because if we can identify that specific person we're talking to, our community, everything is more efficient. So our product is aligned with that person. The price is aligned with that person. The distribution is aligned with that person and the promotion and the communication is aligned with that person. When we say everyone is our customer, we basically talk to no one because it's basically the thing of um, when, we, when we boil down our message and our strategies to talk to everyone, we're pretty much not effective to anyone. So for example, I could say I'm a business coach or I'm a business consultant and some of you would be like, yeah, well, so what? Or some of you might be, oh, wow, I need one. Or some of you might be like, well, what's that and why should I care? But if I can hone that message down so that I get you to self-select um, to choose my service, then that's going to be more helpful and more cost effective. So what we want to do is we want, we want our customers to self-select because if we can get them to, if we can draw the line and get them to self-select, then we have we don't spend as much money trying to accumulate them so this is a graphic i found on the internet and it has a customer avatar so um, we call it the singularity a target but um, the popular uh, nomenclature these days is avatar so i would challenge you all to really think about who your customer is and look at it in these terms so for example, they've identified a male, 40 plus, we wanna know exactly what his age is. And then they ask all sorts of questions around that. Like, how do they make decisions? What, what do they read? What do they like? What do they not like? Where do they hang out on social media? Um, what, what brings them pleasure? What brings them pain? And all those kind of questions. That is what I mean by, do you know your customer? So that's an important thing to think about. Um, I gave an example earlier about SC Johnson and Blade airstrips. So uh, I assume most of you are aware of Blade airstrips. They're the things that you put in a little electric thing and plug into the wall and it makes your house smell nice. And so several years ago, and I don't know how relevant this is now, but they had the singularity of customer and it was we can sort of do this little exercise. So in your mind, just sort of answer this because we don't have a poll for it. So, so for Glade air strips, which make your house smell good, would that be a target to mord a woman or a man? It'd be a woman because a woman cares about her house. Um, is How old is that woman? Is she in her 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s? Um, Glade Glade determined that she was 43. And the question is, is where did she live? Did she live in, a, in the suburb, in a house? Did she, live in a, um, did she live in a condo, in an urban setting? Did she live in a trailer? Did, where did she live? And they determined that she lived in a trailer. And then they, um, the question was, does she have pets? And so the question might be, is does she have dogs or does she have cats? She has cats. How many cats does she have? Does she have one, three, 12? She has lots of cats. And the next question is, is does she smoke or is she a non-smoker? So we can assume that if she's gonna buy something to make her house smell good, she's probably a smoker. So these are all the things that Glade went through to figure out who their target audience was and, 
and how that showed up in advertising is it didn't show some woman, you know, racing around her um, house with a vacuum cleaner and a cigarette coming out of her mouth and shooing off the cats as she vacuumed, it showed a beautiful white house that was clean and pristine. She's dressed in, in white without a care in the world because that's what they assume their customers aspire to. So those are things to think about and that's why you need to know who your customer is. Because if you don't know your customer down to that level, you don't know wh what messages they're going to respond to. So I gave you a little exercise here that you can play with, and this is to create a, create a value proposition. And so the goal of this is um, for, and you would identify your target audience with, and you'd identify what their problem is that they're trying to solve, then you'd include your company's name, and then you'd provide the solution that you, um, that you offer customers. So I did this for Region 10 Small Business Resource Center, and the example is for small businesses that are brilliant at what they do, but need help meeting their financial goals, Region 10 Small Business Resource Center provides training, consulting, and access to capital they need to navigate the road to success with confidence and ease. So the problems that I've identified is they, they're really good at what they do, but they don't know that they don't, you know, most people who run a business do it because they're really good at something. It's not because they know accounting unless you run an accounting service or they don't know marketing unless you're running, um, unless you're a marketing consultant. Most businesses um, start a business because they're good at something and they don't know those business um, uh, sort of the business functions and how to fine tune those things. And so uh, they need help with that. And that's not anything to be embarrassed about. It's just the reality. And so that's why SBDCs uh, provide training and consulting. And if you're lucky enough to sit with a, a local a regional loan fund, then you have access to capital too. But the big thing that, that entrepreneurs want is they want it to be they want to be successful they want it to be easy and they want to be confident so those are the things that they're after so you can see to the degree that we tried to build out who that um, who that avatar is or who that customer is so the next point is you've got to determine what your distribution channels are or your place so that's um, that's really where people make the purchase of your product or service. So if you sell a product, you might be selling it yourself. You might be selling it online. You might have a retail store. Um, the question is, is, you know, if it's a retail store, how clean is your retail store? Do people feel comfortable get going in there? Do people, um, and now is a big question with COVID and all the requirements around having stores open and people coming into your store is do people feel safe? Do they feel comfortable? Do they feel that you're keeping a clean environment or an antiviral environment? Do you have parking spaces? Is it accessible? All that kind of stuff. If you're selling online, um, is your website easy to navigate? Can people find what they're looking for? What about your fulfillment process? Are you um, efficient? Are you quick to fulfill products? Um, one of the issues now, as we mentioned earlier, is that the supply chain's a little bit backed up. So sometimes our fulfillment process during the last four months can be a little scrappy and that's mostly due to, we can't let workers in our place, in our businesses and so online orders are slower to go out. So instead of receiving them in a week, you might get them in two weeks or three weeks or six weeks or whatever. So how do you communicate that to your customer? And then um, let's see, what else do I wanna talk about here? Yeah, I think that's pretty, I think that's, um, I th one of the most important things is where do people look to buy your products? So you, you really have to have a product distribution alignment. Um, an example that I give is several years ago, many years ago, I was in Atlanta and I happened to go into a Costco or a um, Sam's Club, I can't remember which, but a discount place. And uh, I happened to see that BMW had a car parked 
inside the uh, inside the the business, not outside, not somebody who'd driven it up, but it was on display there. And I thought, wow, that's really weird. It just seemed odd to to display a BMW for sale in a discount warehouse. But if you think about it, discount warehouses are really for affluent shoppers because you have to buy in bulk. And so it takes people who have, so Sam's and Costco buy, um, subscribers skew higher household incomes than most grocery stores because even though they buy at discount, they're buying at bulk, which people who are on limited budgets cannot do. So I'm not sure how that worked, how that promotion worked for BMW, but it just seemed like an odd thing for me. So sometimes just think about um, if your product and your distribution channel is aligned. So for example, you wouldn't sell Tiffany diamonds at Walmart, right? So it's just, you've got to, you've got to be where people expect to find you. So that's the point of the distribution. And then there's the promotional strategy. And um, promotion really has to do with what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to create awareness? Are you trying to drive foot traffic? Are you trying to drive sales? What are you trying to do? Because that's gonna set the strategy. And um, sometimes we talk about this in terms of, um, you can have like a whole marketing plan that's sitting in your business plan, or you can have marketing campaigns that have different goals. So you might have a campaign to create awareness or a campaign to create foot traffic or a campaign to drive sales. You just have to know what you're trying to achieve. And so then you have to choose the correct um, communication modes in order to make that happen and which one of those will actually meet your uh, will connect with your target. So again, it's that alignment thing. And what will they respond to? So what we want is we want to make sure that um, we want a tactic that's going to deliver people who want to, um, who are willing to open up their wallets on our doorstep. So that's the one thing you want to look at in your promotions. So a poll for you is how successful are your current marketing efforts in terms of gener generating revenue to operate your business? So if you'll fill that out, I'll continue on and we'll get back to that. So the important thing when you decide to do what your um, communication mechanism is, is you've really got to do your research. And this is when we start to talk about all the social media stuff. Um, the second, the next uh, poll I want to do is um, primary Marcom, and Marcom refers to marketing communication tactics. So that is radio, TV, print, social media, digital um, media, all those kind of things. Are you currently using to get your message out to customers and get customers in your door? So that's the second poll I want. So 50% of you say that your marketing is 70% or better effective. That's awesome. 17% um, say that it's somewhat effective and 33 don't know. And that's, that's not unusual. I'd expect that 33 number to be a bit higher. So a lot of times that looks like that spaghetti on the wall because we can't really tell if it's doing anything for us. The other, um, then, Taylor has the, the, the next one up, the next poll about the Marcom tactics. So you can click as many of these as you use, whether it's collateral, um, something traditional, um, networking and memberships, social media, online, digital, other. So if you'll complete that, we'll come back to it. I pulled up some statistics on Facebook because Facebook gets a lot of, um, it gets a lot of hype. And uh, the fact that it has 2.2 billion monthly users is part of the reason it gets all the hype. So depending on what you're looking for, it can really look like something that's gonna deliver the people to you. So it's got 75% women, it's got, it really touches 18 year olds to 64 year olds. It, it covers urban, suburban, rural, it covers a whole round of income and also education. 
But what this doesn't tell you is what the, it doesn't tell you what people are doing on Facebook. So even though they have an audience of 2.2 billion people monthly, it's not telling you that 64 year old women are actually on there only looking at pictures of their grandkids or seeing what their grandkids are posting. It's not tell, while it tells you it's got a lot of people, it's not telling you what they're doing and what they're doing is really important. So do they use Facebook to um, keep up with their communities and not looking to buy? Do they do it to keep up with friends, you know, high school friends, but they're not looking to buy? Are they doing it to keep up with um, grandkids and people far away, but they don't buy from there? Those are all things you need to know. And uh, that's part of the reason uh, Facebook is, it gets the hype for the numbers, but it, does, it can't get the hype for the conversion. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so for those of you um, in your marketing communication tactics, 71% um, are used in business cards and, and brochures, 86% use social media. So I'm going to challenge you all on that because you all might be the 33% that don't know if it's doing any good. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then the rest of you are somewhat even, uh, although 71% of you are chamber members and 43% use traditional uh, modes, including radio, television, and print. So thanks for completing that. So, so when and how and when to use social media, it's really important to understand that. So social media is awesome for connecting with customers building community and generating leads. So I think the thing that's most valuable with it is really generating leads. And what that looks like is you can take all those quizzes to find what Game of Thrones character you are or all those kind of things. But mostly those things exist so that they can get your email address. Because what they're trying to do is they are trying to build a database of consumers. Because the most important thing is being able to, to communicate directly with your consumers. So for example, if we have a Facebook community, you know, I'll, I don't know how many of you all there are, but for me is I'll join something and then I'll, and then I'll unwatch them or whatever. So I look like I'm a member, but I'm not participating. So I think that happens more often than usual. What's important to think about is uh, Facebook and a lot of social media platforms are less optimal for conversion rates or making sales. So it's awesome at delivering eyeballs, but it's not awesome at delivering dollars. So you could be wasting your time. And this is a slide that I did um, last summer when I was do I did this presentation for Rural Philanthropy Days. And I know that a lot of people, um, resort to Facebook and social media because it's free and my mom's words echo in my head every time I hear that because as she used to tell me what you get what you pay for and when you pay for nothing you get nothing and so I tried to I created this slide to show a bit of how that works so there's the traditional sales funnel that all salespeople use and basically they know they have to get they have to meet with 100 people in order to potentially get two sales. So the translation for that on Facebook is you need basically 10,000 uh, likes in order for 1% to see them, which would be 100 people, and then it falls down to the, to the um, sales funnel. So half of them might read of it, half of them might ask for more information, 10 might consider and 10 might purchase, I mean two might purchase. So there you've done a whole lot of work to, without much return. So that's a little depressing. Um, some other things I think you should consider if you're not doing it already is Google your business is a must. You've got to do that. On this slide, I tried to divide it into long-term and, and immediate um, goals. So uh, Google My Business is a long-term strategy. Uh, SEO is also a long-term strategy because even though you optimize your website or whatever you're doing, it takes a while for the um, Google spiders to find it all. So it's really going to take you about 
I think it's uh, three to six months to actually get any benefit from that. The other thing that's an issue is there are a lot of web designers out there who say they know SEO, but what it really looks like is a Yoast plugin. And that it's better than nothing, but it's not optimal. So for in order to get any serious return on SEO is you've got to pay to play. And most, most of these, um, these promotional tactics are pay to play. And that's why is because they actually deliver. So if you're willing to pay, they will deliver the customers. If you aren't willing to pay, then it's going to be a long, slow growth. And hopefully you have a huge bank account that's going to keep you, tide you over for that. So also database development is so key because that's the long-term strategy of being able to connect directly with your customers through email blasts or however you want to do that. That's more effective than a Facebook post. So in a perfect world, you want to don't let any customer go through your fingers without at least getting their name and their email address so that you can communicate directly with them. Also, um, I was on an agency review call today with um, a business and they were talking about YouTube video targeting, which is an awesome tool for um, anyone who's doing any kind of experiential type marketing, anything that who are delivering a, an experience, particularly like um, uh, tourism or any of that, uh, the price tag they showed on the YouTube videos, which is called a pre-roll, that's like that, um, you know, 30 second video you see before whatever you actually were trying to go watch is that that annual fee can be like 60 to $70,000. So it's a bit expensive. Um, as for content and blog, that used to be really popular uh, about, geez, about, oh golly, what, 10 years ago. And I don't know to what degree it is now because uh, I just don't know that people have time. A lot of people sign up for those things, but then they don't bother reading it. And then, uh, Public relations is an ongoing thing, and some of you might have sponsorships and trade shows. But immediate things is if you want any response from Facebook, you really have got to do the Facebook ads or boosts, and you've got to pay for those. And even with that, you don't always get much delivered. So, for example, as the West Central SBDC, I'll always throw a ten dollar, you know, a twenty dollar boost on our um, posts just to get some engagement. And I find that uh, it's a very high engagement fee. So just be careful about that. Um, also, if you send out press releases about an event or something that you're doing, uh, a lot of times that's immediate effect. The one thing I'll warn you about, about press releases is media outlets really don't care if you woke up this morning. So press releases should be really relevant. They should be important. They should be newsworthy. It shouldn't be that, oh, today the sun is shining. So it has to be about something different. And then I mentioned a couple of things, um, digital uh, geofencing and retargeting. Retargeting is uh, it's it's those crazy face it's those crazy ads that sort of troll you around the internet. So say for example, you're looking at J you heard J Crew is um, filing bankruptcy, so you're going to look to see if they have any sales. And so you go on and you look around, and then you hop off to like three other sites, and that J Crew ad keeps coming back to you. Or um, your empty shop or your shopping cart keeps saying you haven't. It, you haven't clicked pay yet, you haven't clicked pay. So that's what retargeting does. Geofencing is for a mobile phone app where anybody who comes into the geographical area that you have designated. So say for example, you're in Eastern Colorado and you're doing um, workshops for small businesses, then you might do some geofencing that um, targets entrepreneurs and anybody searching for small business resources to get a, a a banner ad about your class coming up. So those are some other things to think about. Those are more digital strategy, but just some things to consider. But what's really important to remember is it is a pay to play option. And the last one I wanna ask you is how much do you guess you spend on your marketing efforts annually? This is one thing that um, the hosts of this show of this um, webinar asked me to cover 
is um, what does your marketing investment show? And basically your marketing investment determines what your growth strategy is. So for example, if you're investing less than 5% of your projected revenues, you have a no growth strategy. And if you um, are bumping it up to 10, you might have a slow growth. If you move it up to 20% of your projected um, revenue, you could have moderate to high. All of this is really content. This is sort of ballpark. It's all contingent on what industry you're in and how old your business is. It, it's contingent on a lot of things, but these are just sort of some ballpark markers. Um, if you're a new company launching a new product, you might spend 25% of your budget. If you're a new company with a new product, if you're trying to launch a new product, it could be 50% 50, 50 or higher. And, and that is think of Super Bowl ads and how expensive they are. My background is product launches, and so I'm familiar with these numbers of how much it costs to actually get these out. So um, on the survey, 60% of you say that uh, marketing is an item on your cash flow spreadsheet and you're committed to it. All I can say is you go. That is awesome to have a commitment to that. And 40% um, of you say that you have some, but you don't know if it's working. So the goal is is to give you the framework and to be able to, to make these purchases or the spending a little bit more um, productive for you. So thanks for that poll. So I made a marketing uh, campaign checklist. And when we talk about this, marketing can either be your marketing plan and your business plan, or it can be the marketing toward a particular campaign. And if you remember the campaigns are a specific goal like um, creating awareness or um, driving people into your uh, location. So I have a whole list of things down here, but I'm gonna focus on the last two because whenever you do a marketing uh, campaign is you really wanna have a schedule to uh, track your promotions. And then you also wanna be able to track your return on investment. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because there are attachments here. So I want you to stop throwing spaghetti. I want you to use this framework. If you're not paying attention to the iceberg below the water, nothing is gonna work for you. So I want you to go from doing this to getting this. So I want to turn the spaghetti to dollars. So. That's what I want you to focus on. So on this one, these are just some addendums to the, to the slideshow. And the Marcom plan is for a particular campaign. It has a particular purpose. You, you've identified who the target is. You know what the message is. And you've set the goals in terms of dollars and customers. Um, and, some, and the dollar and customer might vary just a little bit because one customer might, pay, might buy more than another. But... There are basic goals that sort of, if you keep them in check, they'll pretty much deliver what you're looking for. So what you do is you would say, what am I going to do? And you talk about if you're going to do a Facebook um, or if you're going to do uh, retargeting and what time span are you going to run that? Who's responsible for doing it? And how much is it going to cost? And then we want to look at that cost compared to how many um people actually purchase. So for every single one of these lines is everything that you've done. And it's really important to mix up your communication because if all you do is Facebook, um, people will start not seeing it anymore. But if you do Facebook with a radio ad or um, I was watching the Stitch Fix launch, if you remember that, but they were doing radio ads on NPR when they were doing sponsored ads on um, on. Uh, Facebook, and they were running print ads like in the New York Times. So you want to mix those things up because it's really easy for a consumer to ignore something they see over and over again. But if you put it in different places, they tend to pay attention. And then on the Marcom ROI, that's the return on investment. So what you want to do is from the first page, you want to talk about what the activity was. You want to cover the duration. So if it was a month, a week, a six months, whatever, you want to talk about how many customers you got and or how many sales you got out of that, how many dollars were spent, and I can't see below here, and um, what the difference was. So was it a plus or minus? 
Um, it's just some math of dividing the sales to customers to understand what the return on investment is. So there's that. Um, I guess that's the end of this. I want to let you all ask any questions if you have them. If you've got questions, we've got answers. Be sure to reach out to your S local SBDC. And uh, there it is. So I'll turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Nancy. I really appreciate your presentation today. And wow, I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and have us jump to the next slide. And um, I have got a few more additional resources to share with everyone. Um, the first one is how to run marketing experiments quickly and find big wins. Now, this was one of 70 sessions at the Western Slope Startup Week. Yeah, you heard that right, one of 70. And um, really great one put on by Ellen, the founder of Tough. Um, Tough helps startups unlock revenue by plugging in on-demand growth marketing teams. Um, so really good one. And um, just so you know, these are links within the presentation, which you can find at the East Co website. The next one is for tourism businesses. Um, it's a, a toolkit. Um, called Care for Colorado Toolkit. And really it's about basic messaging with state marketing. Um, and the last resource is called 12 Steps to Content Marketing. And this is by Brian um, Walks and really great um, content marketing tips. So if you are looking on how you can develop quality content, it's the go-to. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to Jamie Biltwalk to wrap things up for us. Thank you, Lisa and Nancy. That was an incredible presentation. If you want to get slides from today's presentation, go to East Colorado SPDC.com slash disaster relief. For more small business resources, um, our SPDC network has a website with COVID resources at the link on your screen. And then re for resources related to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial communities, please visit the Startup Colorado website. Next slide. You can access um, a recording of this call, as well as the incredible sessions that we've had, gosh, over the last several months. Um, some of my favorite were uh, Wicked Problems and legal advice and uh, consumer trends, as well as Main Street programs. So please take a look at the Choose Colorado YouTube channel and, and view past recordings, including this session, which will be up there. If you still have questions, you can visit Startup Colorado at colorado.edu. And our next call will be Wednesday, October, or August 5th, at 3 p.m. Next slide. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your presentation. Nancy and uh, Lisa, your incredible introductions and all of you attendees and your participation in the polls. Please let uh, your other businesses and colleagues know about these sessions and thank you again for joining us.